wonderful legal mind and the legal arguments that he brought up in things like the EIRs of what we sued on and we won on a lot of those. So he has a really work. good Move back. Um, legal mind and he's just, he's done so much, he's yeah, volunteered for so it. long on this project, it's unbelievable. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, thanks, thanks, Kathy. Uh, yeah, uh, this uh, 8,000 page document that just came out two weeks ago, uh, I'm sure you're all going to go and download it and read it. Uh, I, I just tell you from my own experience in reading these documents, uh, it's become a hobby of mine. Uh, there's usually about five pages out of the 8,000 pages that are really useful. It's, it's the needle in a haystack approach. It's finding those five pages. Uh, and the, the lawsuits that I or others have been successful on, I can tell you that the, the evidence is only on a couple pages. Uh, most of the rest of the pages are junk. Uh, often the voluminous uh, environmental impact report documents uh, are done to basically bamboozle the public into thinking that they have no power and they shouldn't even waste any time reading the things in the first place. Uh, that's completely false. I can guarantee you there are plenty of flaws in this project as in every other project that we've dealt with. It's just finding the flaws and suing them to stop them from what they're doing. Uh, one little area of the law that I'm going to be speaking about tonight is what is restoration? The California Coastal Act was passed by the voters of California in 1974 and defined what you can do on a wetland. It, 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 Marina Del Rey Yacht Harbor, it could never be constructed now if it was uh, wetlands now. Only 25% of the area of a wetland could be some kind of boating related use. Uh, the Bayana Wetlands is not being proposed for a yacht harbor, it's only being proposed for restoration. So let's get back to the first slides and uh, what is the definition of restoration? Uh, you know, you look it up in the dictionary, and restoration is you know going back to what it was. Uh, it's not going back to what it never was. That's one of the problems with the restoration project here that we're dealing with. Is that what the state is proposing is something that why on what once never was. Uh, it, what they're proposing is to. Uh, turn it from an ecosystem that is a, a, a freshwater wetland system that had saltwater wetlands at the west end. Those uh, freshwater wetlands would get flooded out by the Bologna Creek during the winter and the spring. A uh, sandbar would form that would then prevent the ocean waters from flowing into the Bayana wetlands. Uh, and what would happen is, is that the wetlands would largely dry out into a coastal prairie type floodplain. So it would have sagebrush, it would have fre freshwater wetland plants. It would also have the salt marsh plants that were would thrive during the spring when there was ocean water. But most of the year, the Bayana wetlands were kind of a dry area. I'm not saying that it's necessarily a good idea that the Bayana wetlands just be dry all the time. It's just that the state's proposal is overwhelmingly a salt marsh project with the after effect of having some upland areas that are the drier ground and almost no freshwater wetlands at all. So it's effectively taking what is an area that has three natural habitats historically, and even today it has those three habitats, albeit in a degraded form. They're not in the greatest of shape, but they're fixable without bulldozing and removing them all in order to do it. Uh, but the state's plan is essentially a monoculture. It's, it's largely one half of other than the three. The three is a balanced ecosystem. It's you know restoring what was historically there rather than wiping it all out and, and doing what's essentially an experiment. Uh, let's go to the next slide. The, uh, yeah, the uh, federal EPA defines it as a return of an ecosystem to close approximation of its conditions prior to disturbance. Uh, now, that doesn't mean going back, say, 10,000 years or 4,000 years. In fact, 4,000 years ago was the last time that the Biota Creek was actually an open sea like the state is proposing. The one difference, however, is, is that the state's proposal is to flood the Biota wetlands with ocean water and polluted urban runoff from Bologna Creek. Take out the levees. Now, the levees in Bologna Creek are artificial, but they actually serve a natural purpose. They protect the Bayana wetlands from all the crud that flows down Bologna Creek when it rains. So, uh, so on one hand, you say it's not natural, it's a man-made feature. But on the other hand, the worst thing is the pollution that flows down Bologna Creek. So is there an alternative? 
This is from the existing conditions report that came out in 2006 that was published by the state's Department of Fish and Game and Coastal Conservancy. And it explained that by 200 years ago, uh, as opposed to 4,000 years ago when the ocean was flowed into the Bionic Creek water area all the time, 200 years ago, sediment accumulation almost entirely eliminated the lagoon and formed a complex of salt and freshwater marshes, ephemeral freshwater pools, which means they, they're there sometimes or not, and sandy islands behind the barrier. The barrier was the sand dunes that were, that were the first quarter mile from the ocean. Uh, those sand dunes actually kind of still exist now. If you can imagine, between the ocean and the Biola Lagoon, there's a, it, it was an area that was about like this, and now it's in Flatten, and it's the Marina Peninsula. The uh, community in Playa del Rey, that's the first block from the beach, that was also a sand dune that's been flattened. I'm sorry, uh, what was the reference? But if you go to our own organization's website, saveallofbiota.org, mm -hmm. we have an environmental research library which has virtually every document from the last 30 years of the Biota Wetlands and the Playa Vista development. Yeah, this is what it looked like. This is the lagoons that existed. This is now the Venice Canals over here. This is approximately Venice uh, Boulevard here, which is the Venice Canals. This is the, the uh, Bayona Lagoon. This is the, this is the Delray Lagoon. Uh, this area here uh, is off the site. So the, the actual only portion of the, the area that we're talking about is here. And the salt pan is here. Yeah, the salt pan is here. The, uh, the, the northern areas of the lagoons have either been preserved as the, Bayano, the uh, Venice Canals, they're part of the Marina del Rey Yacht Harbor, they're in the Bayona Lagoon and the, and the uh, Del Rey Lagoon. This area of uh, marshes has been, is, is part of the Marina del Rey Yacht Harbor now, uh, so the, the open water. Most of the rest of it was what we call a vegetated wetland, uh, which has apparently also gotten cut off uh, of the street somehow. Uh, I got another slide that shows it better. But uh, what it said was this is sand here in this kind of brown, and then the green was the vegetated wetland which dried out in this the summertime. Here's a much better map that shows the exact project out boundaries with those same things. The vegetated wetlands that were just uh, areas that didn't have standing water most of the year except in the winter, and then the sand, the uh, salt, which is called the, the salt flat. Another salt flat, which is not there anymore in the northern portion, north of Bologna Creek. Uh, Bologna Creek is right along here. And then the open lagoon, of which the only actual water feature is what's called Fiji Creek, which is right along here on the north side, along Fiji Way. This was the, you know, how, how Bologna Creek flowed to the sea. It flowed all the way north into here and then turned south, uh, as opposed to now, which is a straight line and armored with concrete. In 2007, uh, Brad Henderson, which was one of the best biologists that the Fish and Game Department ever had, uh, and a local resident, drew up a, a biology study of the existing habitats in the Bayonne Wetlands property that the state acquired. All these areas that are in color, except for this, this area is where you have non-native vegetation. All the other colors are native vegetation, so you have wetlands that were forming in the middle of the north Bayonne Wetlands, what we call parcel A, we had wetlands also up here, uh, wetland vegetation here, pickleweed, uh, various other areas of wetlands. Basically, it looks really good from a, from a biological standpoint. However, once the state bureaucrats decided that they wanted to bulldoze everything and redo it all, they began spreading the word that, oh no, the Bayona wetlands are really, really, really in bad shape. In fact, barely 10% of it even functions in its natural state anymore. Uh, uh, basically, if that was to justify the bulldozing scheme as opposed to a more careful restoration scheme. Is, is that but, on your website, his report, Brad's report? The, uh, Brad's report is, uh, was only a map. Um, it was superseded by the state, which then, uh, a couple years later, uh, other, uh, this is, uh, other, other, uh, other experts for the Fish and Game Commission, after they had made the decision in 2008 to do the massive bulldozing scheme, they revised his map and began shrinking the boundaries yeah. uh, of, of natural habitat, uh, and native habitat, native vegetation, to make it look more degraded. Uh, let's go to the next slide. This is a parcel A area. This is an area that the state wants to bulldoze. That is all native vegetation. This is the pickleweed. This is rainfall that 
Uh, every year you get puddles on the top of it. This is a, what you call a modified uh, elevated salt marsh area that is sustained by rainfall as opposed to ocean water, which would be one of the habitats that would be removed in the project and converted into a salt marsh. Uh, so this type of habitat wouldn't be there anymore. This was an interesting uh, email we got, uh, another, uh, one of the other bio organizations got through the Freedom of Information Act, uh, written by Shelley Luce, who was the project manager for the Biano Wetlands Restoration Project for nine years. Uh, anyway, nevertheless, uh, Shelley Lewis is now the president of Heal the Bay, which is one of the few environmental groups that is endorsing the, the, the state's project like that. Uh, they call it a robust, re robust restoration. Nice buzzword, but... Oh, I mean, there's the law right there. And anyways, the interesting thing was is that this was a, she did a presentation to the Coastal Conservancy when they requested $6 million out of the state budget uh, to begin the restoration planning. And she was basically talking to her staff members and saying, what you've put together so far to present to the Coastal Commission Conservancy Board is not persuasive enough. It's not showing how bad the property, shape the property is. So as you can see here, it doesn't help us meeting numbers like 99% invasive plants and lowest seed bank of any SoCal wetlands. That's not a scientifically justified view, but that was the, what she was trying to convey to the board. And that's, but it's interesting to hear the, the, the thinking of the, the, the people running the show in Sacramento and, and, and downtown. Uh, sorry, got a question, Margo? Well, I and mean, she's saying that to the Coastal Commission staff, who was the project manager. Conservancy, coastal conservancy. Uh, coastal conservancy, sorry. And the collusion is insane. Yeah, that's true. Uh, basically, all the government agencies have pretty much, from the city of Los Angeles to the county to the the, the state and the federal agencies, are all kind of getting together. Uh, they're all they, they've all decided that they think this is that the destruction scheme is a good idea. Uh, I obviously don't agree. <laughs> I suspect a lot of you feel the same way. Let's go to the next slide. This is the beginning, this is uh, showing what the state is proposing to do on the site. This is the, there are three alternatives, and there's a fourth alternative that says do nothing. There were other alternative proposals that were made by environmental groups. Uh, my organization, the Biota Ecosystem Education Project, made specifically a historically accurate proposal to restore the freshwater habitats. Uh, small creek systems running through the property, uh, clean water from Bionna Creek, after you clean up Bionna Creek, of course, because Bionna Creek, Creek is dirty right now, and uh, having salt water coming in from the western end, uh, a more balanced ecosystem approach. And we have a picture we'll show you of that rendering. We put together this together 20 years ago with uh, two of the top wetland and uh, scientists and botanists, one of which was the botanist for Playa Vista, who his bio bot botany studies were taken and rewritten by the quote, biologist slash lawyer that worked for Playa Vista. Uh, and so that's why he jumped ship. But he wrote the, the biology studies, botany studies, for the first phase development of Playa Vista. That was Jim Hendrickson. The marine bio biologist that, that co-wrote our report, our plan, was Dr. Rimmon Fay, who was one of the first coastal commissioners and a strong advocate for uh, you know, wetland conservation on the Nile California coast. He's, he's since passed away. Uh, anyways, so you can see, this is the state's proposal the areas that are in brown are the upland habitat, the areas in green are the wetland habitats. Now, let me go to the next slide and you'll see how it would be modified. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, alternative two. Alternative two is slightly different. Uh, it, it, it's, it's almost exactly the same. It's just uh, the dredging of this area in the first project. Can we go back one? The, the dredging of the salt pan and the fresh, the, uh, the uh, pickleweed zone in the West End would be it would be dredged out in this project. In the other project, which is go to the next slide, the alternative two, this area would not be touched. A areas that are, have dots are areas that are not going to be touched. Basically, everything else that you can see that doesn't have you know, doesn't have dots, except for this little tiny area here and uh, this little tiny area here. Everything else would be somehow modified and bulldozed by the, the state's proposal. The, the alternative three, I think that might be the next slide, let's see, uh, is again very similar other than that the levees of Bologna Creek will remain. Uh, it's still the same uh, effective dredging, huge area. Actually, I'm sorry, alternative three is, is 
just stretching this area and then not touching most of this area. So it actually has some merits in alternative three in that it's, it's, it's effectively the, the no production alternative for this area, except that it's affecting all the north section. Is that the Oxbow alternative? That's the Oxbow alternative. Yeah. So uh, next slide, please. This is the areas that are being filled that are going that will be up, uphill in the in the proposed project. Uh, let's go to the next slide. This uh, shows again in, in all. Uh, can, we, can we go back one? My slides are a little screwy here. Watch me one. Okay, that's okay. So this is the areas that have been filled. Now we'll go to the next slide. So you can see now the areas that are going up, 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 and the areas that are going down. The areas that are going up in parcel C, uh, it's now 16 feet above sea level. It will be 43 feet above sea level. Uh, hills like that never existed because historically, because the Wyoming wetlands were flat, they were three to five feet elevation at the most. Question? Where is all that fill supposed to be coming from? Well, it's going to be dug out of here. That's what the minus signs are where they're taking out 20 feet of dirt here in order to put it here. Uh, each one of these areas will be raised up. This will be raised by five feet. This will be raised, so it's about 10 feet now. It'll be 15 feet. This berm along Clover Boulevard, which is about 10 feet, will be 20 feet tall. Uh, so you can imagine, by the way, as you drive down Jefferson, most of the wetlands will not have that north view anymore. The areas over here, which are now 10 feet, will be, I think, 25 feet tall. So it's 15 feet of soil that will be dug. Uh, that's under the proposed, the state's proposal, uh, favorite pro project alternative one. So we got all, the next slide. This is an alternative two areas that will be filled. The area right here, which is all marsh areas, would be filled in and turned into an upland uh, with everything that's dug out of here. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So you can see better the plus signs of what's being raised and what's being lowered. What's really interesting to me is, is that in looking at all these, these pictures, these renderings, is that and if you were to go back to the habitat map that I showed you that Brad Henderson drew up, is, is that the state's proposal is largely taking wetland areas that are here, converting them into uplands, and taking uplands that are here and converting them into wetlands. And so the question is, is that what are we accomplishing? If the goal is to, to rewater the wetlands, that's one thing. Uh, everything on the south side of Walnut Creek is about a three elevation. The areas that are on the north side of Walnut Creek, although they historically were wetlands, are about 50 to 20 feet above sea level. Those are perfect uplands. If, if, you know, if we're, we're going to have uplands anyways in the project, and we're going to have about a, kind of an even split between wetlands and uplands, why don't we restore the wetlands where they are, restore, restore the uplands where they are, and don't spend all that money. Well, what the outcome will be the same. Uh, let's go to the next slide. This shows you uh, Jefferson Boulevard, uh, the freshwater marsh at Clay Vista, and this is where they're going up to 22 feet tall. This is currently, uh, current elevation is 3 feet, so that's 18, 16 to 18 feet of elevation from this area. Uh, next slide. This is again, uh, 40, 43 feet is actually the hilltop over here. We were wondering why they were talking about uh, landfilling this area over here, uh, which is the home to the Lewis's eating primrose. That's one of the plants, and also the Southern tar plant, which is another endangered species, has been found on the site. Apart from all the other native vegetation, such as pickaweed and uh, uh, alkali weed, and uh, coyote bush, and sage, various types of sagebrush, and there's lupin bushes, all those would be filled in. Well, what's interesting is, is that when the state had the Annenberg proposal, which I'm sure you may have remembered that about five years ago is when it started, uh, when the state's project manager secretly negotiated with the Annenberg Foundation to locate a supermarket-sized building, that was what they were proposing to do, was to put it right here. It, so it may make you wonder, why are they needing to jack up this area of the property by 25 feet? Uh, basically, Annenberg wanted, I, I think they wanted an ocean view site. If you've ever been on this land, you, you don't see the ocean. I mean, you, you see the site, it's nature and, and the wildlife, but if you have a 25-foot tall berm, suddenly you have an ocean view site. So we never know, you know, I, I mean, I just don't trust the state. 
and the people that have been running this project have been so secretive, and I mean, they hold planning meetings at Costa Mesa, they, they have public comment at the end of seven hour meetings, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, they, they've not been really inviting the public to get involved in the process except 12 years ago, and everything that we said to them disappeared. It ultimately became the project that they, somebody wanted, not us, but all the environmental groups in this area, all their input was just tossed out. Uh, it is in the EIR, by the way, in its 8,000 page document. It's contained within about four pages, uh, if you know where to look for it. And what it says is, is that none of it is feasible, uh, it would require too much expense, too much maintenance, and it's kind of interesting because ultimately, if you think about maintenance, this is extraordinarily expensive. This is 100 to $200 million to, to dig out this entire site, to create it. Uh, also, to clean up the pollution in Bologna Creek, you see, that's one of the interesting things is that if you can't flood the Bayonne wetlands with dirty water, the Federal Clean Water Act bans that. In order to clean that water, it, the city of Los Angeles is preparing to spend $3 billion on an upstream Bayonne watershed cleanup plan. So you start thinking, well, that's $3 billion to clean the water before it gets into the Bayonne wetlands. That's, that's a lot of money. Uh, yeah, obviously, the uh, shoaling issue is, is kind of interesting is that, and this, is, this has been the same problem with the other, the only other major wetland restoration project that's been done in Southern California recently, and that's Bolsa Chica wetlands. The Bolsa Chica wetlands has an ocean inlet into the property, which basically every year the, the tidal flow pushes sand and blocks that, that ocean access. So while it was a good idea from their perspective, the constructors of the Bolsa Chica wetland restoration to, to bring in ocean water, Mother Nature, Father Nature, whatever, whoever's running the show here, uh, had, had other ideas. And as it turns out, the Bolsa Chica wetland restoration was largely becoming what the Bayana wetlands has been historically, which was a, a freshwater zone that dries up in the summer. Uh, and so if nature is trying to turn Bolsa Chica wetlands restoration project into the same kind of thing. So that's the same thing that we face here at Biota Wetlands, is that Biota Creek it has general, it's going to have maintenance issues also, shoaling, just like the Marina del Rey Harbor entrance has to be dredged every few years because of the ocean is dumping sand into, the, into the, that channel in order so that boats can sail out. So, so you've got a lot of maintenance issues no matter what. With their project, $200 million maybe in construction and maintenance, uh, and, and we don't know what the maintenance is every year, compared to doing the natural approach, leave everything where it is and just do the, the, the kind of more holistic, uh, leave the habitats where they are, it's got to be a lot cheaper. But the, it was never analyzed. Uh, I'm still on the picture. Uh, okay, one more, one more picture, one more slide, Jen. So Lewis is in Eden Primrose, tiny. It's about the, the flower is the size of a quarter. You know, it's this tall. They're, they're barely this high above the ground. There's a lot of areas in the northern section of Parcel C, north of the Little League. This is our proposal that we made 20 years ago with Dr. Fay and Dr. Henderson that shows creek restoration, leaving the Bayona Creek levees there because Bayona Creek is still polluted, putting small Delta region of creeks rather than removed at all. Now, I think the number 64, state's preferred proposal is this is the state's proposal. Hmm. Now, uh, I, I'm going to run through just, just a couple of the legal issues that I found. I've only read about 100 pages, about 8,000 pages, but these were the, the uh, legal deficiencies that I found, uh, which I think are important. As the project is not a replacement of what was there before we destroyed it, it is not a restoration. Restoration is all that is permitted under the Coastal Act. If the pro project applicants can define restoration as anything they want, the law means nothing. If this project isn't restoration, then it's development. That's the only other choice you have. But development is not allowed in a wetland in, under the California Coastal Act. So that's one of our trump cards, is that if this project isn't a historically active restoration, then it's not a restoration, period. It doesn't matter if they have 8,000 pages saying otherwise, it's not. It's piecemealing. Piecemealing is a CEQA argument that we often make successfully in, in court cases. It's a little arcane, but you'll understand what I'm talking about, uh, hopefully with what I just say here. Project splitting is what is piecemealing. It's to avoid revealing the magnitude of impacts 
we have three projects split into smaller bites to create inertia that cannot be stopped with approval of smaller pieces that seem benign. The cleanup of upstream dry and wet season runoff is required for this project to be legal due to the Clean Water Act's prohibition on flooding the Biona wetlands with polluted water. A plan to clean it is an integral part of the Biona wetlands restoration project, but there is no approved plan for a dry or wet season creek runoff. Thus, the only way for the Biona wetlands restoration project to be legal in this respect is to include such cleanup plans in this EIR, the 8,000 page document, and analyze their impacts, eliminate or mitigate their impacts, and consider a reasonable range of alternatives, etc. That is what CEQA, which is the California Environmental Quality Act, requires. California Environmental Quality Act is the law that requires the creation and preparation of the environmental impact report. Likewise, the recently released Dry Season Creek Pollution Cleanup Plan, which uh, the comments deadline was Monday, yeah, yesterday. Uh, I know I and Kathy Knight uh, submitted comments, so a lot of what I'm reading to you today, Jeanette submitted comments. Uh, it, it will be going to hearings uh, and uh, uh, likely litigation. Likewise, the recently released Dry Season Creek Pollution Cleanup Plan diverts away most of the fresh water that could be, that could be used to restore the Biona wetlands to their historic natural state. Thus, the dry season plan impacts this wetland restoration plan by putting up a huge obstacle to the only legally allowable restoration plan. Yet that project's EIR says it has no impacts on the wetlands. Clearly not true. Uh, finally, last legal point, there is not a reasonable range of alternatives. The law requires under both the California Environmental Quality Act and the federal law, which is known as the National Environmental Policy Act, it, analyzing and revealing the impacts of the project in relation to a reasonable range of alternatives. The fact that all three alternatives look very similar and have near identical impacts is because the project objective that defines what the alternatives are under their reasoning is so narrowly drawn that no alternatives proposed by community members that are true restoration and less impacting got considered or analyzed as they, quote, don't fulfill the project objective of creating a salt marsh or estuarine habitat. So that said, those are the legal problems that I found in the first 100 pages of the EIR that I read. We now have until November 7th for the first public hearing, which is going to be in this room. It's from 6 to 8.30. On November 8th. Obviously, the 45-day comments deadline, we want to get it extended to 120 days. Normally, of a project of, of this size, uh, like the, the Playa Vista first phase project, they, they had a 120-day review period. The Playa Vista second phase project, which had 135,000 pages ultimately in the record, but it had EIR that was this day. Same situation. They gave us multiple months to review it, rather than just expect us to, you know, in the holiday season to go and read 8,000 pages in 45 days. I think that's unfair. Uh, uh, so, so. Any, anyways, I think that concludes my presentation. Uh, do you guys have any, have any questions? Thank you, Brandon. <laughs> The way this works is, is that the Department of Fish and Game, if they approve the project, the Fish, it's the Fish and Game Commission, that sets, that starts the opportunity to file a lawsuit. The project also has to be approved by the Army Corps of Engineers, so there would be a court, uh, a, a lawsuit that would have to be filed in federal court against the Army Corps of Engineers. The third lawsuit is, would be against the California Coastal Commission, which hasn't even begun a review of the project yet. But the California Coastal Commission is our strongest likelihood of success because they have much tougher laws. They're the ones that define what is a re wetland restoration. The, the CEQA and the National Environmental Policy Act, uh, those type of lawsuits are, are merely over the disclosure of the impacts of the project. They're what you call a procedural law. They require basically studies and revealing the impacts to the public and attempting to mitigate and compensate and fix the impacts. The Coastal Act is what's called a substantive law. It actually prohibits things. It prohibits development of wetlands. It prohibits 
re restoration projects that are not really restoration projects. So that's why the Coastal Commission, that's the third agency, if they were to do the wrong thing and approve the project, there would be a, a lawsuit against them. Uh, Joe? Any? I don't know how pertinent this is, but uh, is the water that uh, Playa Vista sucks up to uh, <laughs> take care of the gas issue, uh, uh, does that have any impact on what the EIR is attempting to do? It's, uh, you know, I haven't read in the EIR, I haven't read that section of the EIR. Uh, certainly sucking water out of, the groundwater out of the, the Bionic Wetlands area, I mean, just immediately east of the Bionic Wetlands, it's got to have some kind of impact. Uh, you know, clear, clearly the freshwater, if the Bionic Bion area uh, was a freshwater, you know, wetland area largely, uh, the, the fact is that in the summer when it dries out, it would be great to have that groundwater to keep stuff going. So. It, I, I, would, I, would, I would say yes, it does have an impact. Uh, but that's a section I haven't read yet. Okay. John? I'm wondering, how much of a foundation do you have with the Coastal Commission and the Army Corps of Engineers? Have you spoken with Don, Dan Swenson and his staff, and have you spoken with Jack Ainsworth and their staff? Is there any kind of communication with a group of Sierra Club and or whatever you're working with? We need to begin doing that. Uh, we had a pretty good relationship with the Coastal Commission staff. The last permit that they approved, uh, or actually denied, in 2003, which was the widening of Lincoln Boulevard. So we had lots of meetings with them. Uh, they ultimately, the staff, sided with us. And then the Coastal Commission, uh, the 12 members, voted against the project. All but one person on the commission voted against the Lincoln Boulevard widening because that would have impacted the wetlands alongside Bologna Creek. Uh, so uh, we, we need to start that anew. It's been, 14 years. Any, um, just a follow-up question, please. <clears throat> Any public record fact as far as what the Coastal Commission has done in the way of restoration of, of wetlands up and down the coast? Uh, do, you have, do you have any idea, you know, what are they likely to do? At, uh, is it Bolsa Chica? Bolsa Chica. Okay, and some of these other wetlands that they have protected, is there any kind of uh, significant gains that could be made by looking at documentation from other restoration projects to be able to implement in, in this particular area? That's a good question. I, I, I don't know. I haven't even thought about that point. Uh, I, I would say that the Bolsa Chica restoration, the ocean inlet that was done at Bolsa Chica that was approved as part of that project, uh, it's, it's, it was a very different situation in that activists were so happy to get that area saved that nobody protested the ocean inlet, uh, basically because the funding source to acquire the Bolsa Chico wetlands from the developer was provided by the Los Angeles and Long Beach Harbor Departments, which were doing what was called basically, they call it a mitigation project. It was compensating for basically 10 to 20 foot deep water in the LA and Long Beach harbors that were being filled in and turned into islands. So those 20 foot deep and so, you know, deep water wetlands that were being destroyed, the law required like replacement of them. And so in order to, for the harbor departments to fund the Bolsa Chica restoration, there had to be a deep water or wetland component in the project in order to get the money. That was, the, that was a compromise that the folks in Bolsa Chica made after fighting to save that property for 30 years because it was all going to be wiped out originally. It was going to be 5,000 homes, it was going to be a yacht harbor and all concrete. And so when they got an angel, uh, you know, the Harbor Department, they figured they, they would take it. Uh, you know, I, I'm, not in favor, I, I'm not totally opposed to an ocean access, you know, ocean water flowing into the Bayano Islands. I think to have a balanced ecosystem, you need to have salt water. But you need to have the fresh water too. And that's really the problem here is that the state is, is cutting the fresh water out, is, is cutting the ecosystem down largely from, you know, a three-part three, three ecosystem to mostly one. Margo? So if we can, uh, Margo, would you like to use some more? No. If we can use the idea of it's not restoration, there's another point we can follow, which is the money that they've used all these years for planning. Those are bond issue monies, I believe, for restoration. 
So there, there was $25 million that was left over that was allocated for Biana Wetlands as part of the Proposition uh, yeah, Prop 12 and 13 that were approved by the voters in around 2002, 2002, 2002. Uh, so that, that's, there was six and a half million dollars that the Coastal Conservancy approved, which was, I guess that was part of their take, their, their chunk of the money that was in those bond issues. That was approved in uh, January of 2012 uh, by the Coastal Conservancy, allocated for planning. Uh, you know, I mean, the question of, you know, going and attacking the funding source, I, I think, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, if you want to oppose this project, you, you gotta go after it all, all the ways. You gotta go after it from an environmental, Planning perspective, you've got to go to the government agencies and say you're not spending the money on what it's supposed to be spent on. Right. Uh, you know, clearly, the uh, when the state acquired the Biota Wetlands for 140 million, they bought it for restoration purposes. They didn't buy it for something totally, you know, that wasn't a restoration. So that that's a potential taxpayer lawsuit. Continue. Another point is they've never moved budge in the end. You've made recommendations. Others have made recommendations, professors. They haven't budged. The latest science doesn't impress them. I mean, these are all arguments against their project. They're not even using the most recent science on the issue of bionis. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, it, it, does so, it does happen that uh, state agencies differ with each other. Uh, when the Lincoln Boulevard widening proposal to double the width of Lincoln Boulevard over Bologna Creek was rejected by the Coastal Commission in 2003, the project was wholeheartedly endorsed by Caltrans State Highway Department. So it's not unusual for two different state departments uh, to, to go against each other. The Coastal Commission has a, a substantive law, a very strong law, that they are, you know, despite political influence, uh, they're notoriously good at uh, asserting it when it comes to like issues of habitat. They're not that good, I mean, John can tell you about issues relating to development of marine in LA. The Coastal Commission hasn't been that good at protecting it. Uh, but when it comes to, uh, and maybe it's, you know, I, I don't understand the law well enough, but uh, the Coastal Act is, 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 is a lot tougher on habitat preservation in you know, wetland areas. Uh, it gets into, when it gets into areas that it, maybe they feel is not, it's more political, they don't often stick their noses into it. Uh, then again, there's a lot of money to encourage development of Marina del Rey. Uh, you know, restoration of the Bayana Wetlands, uh, I don't know if, it's, if anybody's making any money off it or not. Uh, I'll let you guys figure that out. Uh, one more question. Then. Is there anything in there about the gas storage? Is mm -hmm. it yeah. It, 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 is, it is mentioned. I haven't read that section, but it's one of the in, in hazards, yeah. geologic hazards. Yes, but they, there's no impact. Well, what they're talking about is relocating. They're not. They're not going. They're not going to close down the gas storage no. facility. What they're talking about in their plan is to, to uh, abandon the basically cap the gas wells uh, that are in the like north of Bologna Creek and north of Culver Boulevard. Uh, consolidate them in the gas company's own property because right now there's all these gas actual wells that are in the state property. Uh, that's all they're talking about. They're not talking about shutting down the gas storage field, at least from what I can see in this. And the, and the reason probably is because if the gas company decides they want to do it, then it's their own EIR uh, to, to, do, to do that project. But, you know, the gas company makes money. As the speaker, Alexander Nagy, last month spoke to this group, explained, gas company makes a lot of money, even though this play del Rey field is really not needed. It's not necessary for efficient and safe operation of the, the whole system that we have. It's a, it's a money-making system. It's a bank, essentially, for people that speculate and buy gas when it's, when it's cheap, and then store it in the gas company's reservoirs, and then sell it when the market goes up. Uh, yeah, so we're going to um, take a break and write some letters, and then we can ask questions more later of Rex. Um, I just want to say a couple of things. Um, people were asking about the water and supply of Vista. I just want to say, um, I've been heard that it, they've taken out 600,000 gallons of water a day from underneath Playa Vista, and they were supposed to clean it and put it back into the wetlands, and they're not cleaning that. It's going to the ocean. So, um, that, and then also the berms, the berms that are 20 
uh, 15 to 25 feet high that they're building, that Rex talked about. Um, some of them are called vegetation-free burns. And that means, that means, from what we understand, that if any animals go in there and try to live there, they'll get poisoned, you know. So, and then anything that eats those poisoned animals will die. So the whole thing is like completely not oriented towards uh, respecting the wildlife out there. Anyway, um, Do they so define that in the EIRs? What? Do they define that, that they'll be maintaining those birds as animal and vegetation free? Yeah, one of the uh, drawings over there calls it a vegetation free zone. One of the birds is over there on one of their maps. Kathy, those, those drawings are taken out of the, the, the new document? Uh, yeah, just came well, out. Um, um, did everybody get a copy of the form letter and the, um, the second page of where they send it? Does anybody need a... There's two pages. What we've done is typed up a letter which asks for two things. One, the 120 days extension. We need that. Two, to say that we need a freshwater, seasonal wetland alternative. Both of those things are in the pre-written letter. Now, for example, Jeff Sue brought up the oil, the gas field. Uh, there is a little area where you can write another comment. You're not limited to asking for these two things, but we really need these two things. And then we would encourage you to write whatever else concerns you. The date, of, the date for the closing of the public comment is when the original scheduled to close the public comment on this draft year. Day after Thanksgiving. Day after Thanksgiving. It's no longer a protected wetland. Once they do anything to it, any kind of restoration whatsoever, it doesn't meet the de definition under law as a wetland, as or a natural kind of, wetland. Any kind of bulldozer. Any bulldozing, anything they do to it. If they take a shovel and then just start excavating, yep. it is no longer a natural wetland. It does not meet the definition. Any lawyer can go to court and say, listen, Your Honor, this is no longer open. Listen, we, you know, we just bulldoze this. This is not a... And the Coastal Commission knows that, and matter of fact, uh, Mary um, Schallenberger raised that point in, in one, of the, uh, one of the critical uh, times up in, in uh, Northern California, where one of their wetlands was, and she said, no, not on, not on my watch. You are not touching that wetland, because we know what that means. That means that it's no longer, that, and it no longer is under protection of, under the uh, Coastal Act. So don't let them touch it, because that's the first thing they do is say, Oh, there it is. It's no longer okay. So now we're going to start. The, the reason I think that the the state has chosen a project that basically has no fresh water flowing into it is is because the there was a project that was a uh, common deadline ended last Monday, two, yesterday. The, uh, the, what's this called? The uh, Bayona Creek uh, dry season bacteria total maximum daily load bacteria cleanup. It's cleaning up the pollution that flows down Bayona Creek during the dry season. And what the City of LA Sanitation Department has proposed to do is, is construct a, a facility along Bologna Creek that intercepts the water that flows down Bologna Creek during the dry season, uh, treat uh, a quarter of the water, three quarters of the water, and it will be sent to Hyperion Sewage Treatment Plant where it will be put into the sewage treatment system and then treated to, re to remove the pollutants and things like that. But the one quarter of the water uh, that, is, that is taken by this plant will be dumped back into Bologna Creek. Uh, if you look at Bologna Creek and you drive, say, over uh, Sepulveda Boulevard uh, in that area, where there is no tidal influence into Bologna Creek, basically the, the tide flows all the way up to Sentinel you know, Avenue now. But if you go east of there in Bologna Creek, you'll see very little water during the dry season. If you can imagine only a quarter of that amount of water, uh, you, you, can, you can just then imagine that how wildlife that relies upon that water is going to be starved for water. And so the city of LA's policy uh, beyond that 
is the proposals for the wet season, cleaning up the bionic creek pollution in the wet season, is to divert as much as possible of the rainfall, keep it from getting in a blown creek in the first place. That's their plan, which is a $3 billion plan that is, uh, uh, has not been approved. The wet season plan has not been unveiled. We don't really know what it's going to be. Uh, I have my suspicions. I've been at meetings where they describe some ideas. But that, again, that plan is, is pollution will not get into the creek, will not flow to the beach if we keep the water, as much rainfall as possible, out of the creek in the first place. And so that the dry season and wet season pollution cleanup plan for Bologna Creek, if they are approved, deprives virtually all the flow of fresh water in Bologna Creek that could get to the Bionic wetlands. And what's interesting is, is that the Bionic Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission, the chairperson is the LA Sanitation Department. And the Bay Foundation, which is the, the nonprofit organization that is run by the Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission, which is supposedly running the whole Bionic Wetlands Restoration Project, they're, they're, all, they're all the same people, basically. It's all the same hats. It's all the same government agencies all together, the state, federal, local officials, that are all basically, if you start to read into this, it's sucking up every drop of water in the water creek that they can and putting it into the water table so it can be enhancing the drinking water supplies of Los Angeles, which on the one hand, it's not a horrible thing, but on the other hand, every drop of water we ever save in Los Angeles gets handed to developers. Yeah. So, you know, every time we save water with the water saving faucets, water saving shower heads, converting our front lawns into, you know, like no water lawns, that water doesn't go back to environmental purposes. It serves the development industry. So that's just something to think about, is that the policy of the city of Los Angeles, in order to clean up pollution, keep pollution from getting to the beach, is to get rid of the water that carries that pollution to the beach. Which is, which, is, which is why we need to make certain, by the way, that the, the, there was two, alter, two versions of the project for the dry season cleanup. One was take the water, three quarters of the water out of the creek, set it to Hyperion, and leave a quarter in the creek. The other alternative, which I endorsed in my comment letter yesterday, was clean the water and put it all back in the creek. So that's something to advocate. That project will be, there will be a final EIR, there will be a public hearing on it. That's the opportunity for us to comment and say that we want to make certain that all water that's in Walnut Creek stays in and gets cleaned up and is used to restore wildlife habitats at Bionic Wetlands. Not same. wasted. Because if it's sent to Hyperion, by the way, Hyperion just dumps it in the ocean. Well, they're going to have to swap that. Hyperion isn't reusing, it's only reusing about 10% of the water that flows into Hyperion now. And the problem is that if you build a second Hyperion, that's what you need in order to fully treat Hyperion's flow. And you know Hyperion is 300 acres. That's, there's no land available to do that. There's also the problem of treating sewage to the high level that's enabling to use it for street landscaping. It's not suitable for drinking water because that requires reverse osmosis. So the, the fact of the matter is there's not enough money or capacity to treat all the water in Hyperion. So we don't need to take Bionic Creek water and send it to Hyperion. It doesn't benefit them. Why, why can't, the, why are they still pumping water out of the Playa Vista? I thought they were supposed to clean that water and put it in that. If there's, there's two different pumping operations. The eastern end of Playa Vista has groundwater contamination. That is volatile organic chemicals or solvents, or PCE or TCE uh, from the, the, heat, the, the Howard Hughes uh, aircraft facility. That water is being pumped to the surface, it's being aerated, it's being charcoal filtered, and then it's being dumped into the poured into the creek that runs along the base of the bluffs. That play is to call the riparian core. Right. So that water, that's that's what that water then ultimately flows into the freshwater marsh system west of Lincoln and then flows through a pipe underneath Culver Boulevard and Jefferson and goes into Bologna Creek. Then there's the groundwater that's being pumped in the west end of the play of this development. That is the methane mi mitigation system. And that water, as far as I understand, is being pumped out and then goes into the Hyperion system. Unless I'm wrong. It's true that it's true in both cases it's not going into the Bionic wetlands. Uh, the, the freshwater marsh flow that, that starts from the, the treatment facility flows into the freshwater marsh and then overflows into the Bologna Creek. 
So it's not, it, it, it's potentially a freshwater wetland, so, freshwater source that could be used. Uh, now, that the problem is, is that Playa Vista, when they gave that land to the state, the State Land Commission now owns the freshwater marsh. But Playa Vista has a deed restriction that says that Playa Vista basically has the right to have all the things that they've done. The, uh, they, the state can't undo the freshwater marsh, even though they own it. Because Playa Vista has the rights perpetuity to continue operating their freshwater marsh system. It basically cleans up the pollution that Playa Vista, pavement over Playa Vista, polluted street runoff that's created by 400 acres of new pavement in the phase one and two of Playa Vista. That's, Playa Vista has needed that facility, the freshwater marsh, to clean up their pollution to comply with permits that the federal and state you know, governments require, that are, you know, the Clean Water Act. And we need to come to that meeting on the 8th. Pack the meeting, standing room only, uh, no matter what, just get here, uh, you know, fill out their cards, even if you, you have to leave, just, just write down, say you were there, and say you want a, you know, a, a historical, historically accurate freshwater uh, marsh restoration system, alternative to the study. Things is that the proposed project has two phases. Yeah. They're going to obliterate some of the pickle habitat in the proposed project, which is the home for the buildings of Anastero. And, and then they're saying, uh, so what you're saying is in 30 years, they will then replace that. I don't know if it's 30, you say 30 years is they're how they're doing the greenhouse gas. Right. I'm saying they're doing it across, perhaps, the phasing. I don't know how long that phase document. I, really, the document is horrible. It's one of the worst. I, I, I tell you, I've only actually read 100 pages. So, <laughs> it's it's real, it's a lot of the tables say five years, phase one and then phase two, which seems there's a gap of five years, or phase one is implemented and then phase two will be implemented within five years, so they will be in phase one in five years, which seems wildly optimistic based on the amount of earth movement. Where is the money? Millions of dollars. Where is the money coming from? That's a good question. Does they have federal money? They, there's, there's currently, a, the only money that the state has from bond issues is for planning. There is no money for, you know, it's, it's all being eaten up. There was $25 million to fund restoration, and I bet that this 8,000 pages has eaten up a lot of that money. <laughs> so that's good. But it's estimated, the original estimates were $200 million to do the restoration project. Uh, I've seen numbers of you know, down to $100 million. Uh, but this is such an extensive project, and with inflation, you remember, that was 2008. You, uh, come to the Culver City Library next Monday, uh, where we'll probably have a lot of these ideas to deal better. We'll probably have a better idea of, you know, what are the important sections of the environmental impact. Six o'clock. Six o'clock. Uh, you know, hopefully we'll have a better picture of what needs to be done. If we can all break it next week, we read something, you know, make, makes your, your BS dependent go off. Just make a note of it. Uh, I mean, personally, I'm going to try to read the whole damn thing. But there, there will be a lot more, a lot more activists and organizations that have filed litigation that will be there on next Monday. So you'll be able to hear their perspective. Just, like, the Biola Wetlands Land Trust is organizing that meeting. Yeah. 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 Yeah.